So there's this man. He lives in this fishing village that's on the floodplains of a river. And every year, the monsoon comes, the river rises, but the village is far enough back to where it never has to worry about flooding. This year, however, it's the monsoon of the century. The river's rising more rapidly than ever before. This village is getting ready to be swept away. Everyone in the village is freaking out. They're packing up and getting out of there, except for this one man. This one man, instead, he gets on his knees and he prays to God. He says, God, save me from this flood. The next day, water starts pouring into the village. It's only about ankle deep. One of the man's friends comes by in his truck, calls out to him, Hey, buddy, come get in my truck. I'll take you to safety. The man looks at his friend, says, I don't need your truck, because God's going to save me. The friend drives away. The water level continues to rise. We're now about waist high. The man has another friend come by. This time he's in a boat. The friend calls out, hey, buddy, come get in my boat. We've got to get out of here. I'll take you to safety. The man looks at his friend, says, I don't need your boat. God's going to save me. His friend, slightly confused, motors off. Waters continue to rise, and at this point, the man has no choice but to sit on his roof. It's the only way he can avoid the flood. A search and rescue crew hear about this man. They send a helicopter in. They hover above his house. They drop some ropes down, and a crew member rappels down with an extra harness. They say, get in the harness. We're going to take you to safety. The man looks at the crew member and says, I don't need your harness, and I don't need your helicopter, because God is going to save me. The crew member argues with the man. I mean, it's like the village is getting ready to be swept away. It's all but gone. We have to leave now. The man refuses. He will not leave his roof. The search and rescue crew, well, they have other people they need to save, and so they leave the man as he wishes on that roof. The water level continues to rise. The man gets swept away, and he drowns. Now he gets to heaven. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's got to talk to God about something. He walks up to God. He looks God in the eyes. He goes, God, why didn't you save me? God looks down, calmly replies, I sent you a truck, I sent you a boat, and I sent you a helicopter. You see, much like this man, I have learned that things often happen in ways we do not expect. But fortunately, I didn't have to die to figure that out. (laughs) I was once told, the greatest way to find your purpose in life is look where the world's problems and your passions intersect. So today, I'm going to tell you the story of how I found a purpose while sitting in a business class. But it might not be what you'd expect. In a 2009 survey done by Michael Leahy of North American College Students, it was found that 64% of college males and 18% of college females look at porn every week. In the covenantized publication Porn Stats, it is said that exposure to porn increases the likelihood of participating in casual sex, and therefore contracting STDs, that people who view porn are more likely to accept violent sexual behavior such as rape, that people who view porn are more likely to be averse to intimate relationships with family, friends, and loved ones, that men who view porn are more likely to look at women as objects of sexual pleasure and not as people. In Fight the New Drugs article, is the problem porn or shame or both? It illustrates how porn leads to guilt, shame, and depression. See, this sounds like a problem, especially to me. But if we compare this to something we know is a problem on college campuses, alcohol. The Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism found that 60% of college students use alcohol in a month. That's less than the number that look at porn in a week. Almost a bigger problem, however, is the fact that porn is just not talked about. In our hypersexualized culture, porn is either ignored or accepted. Thanks to the people I'm around, the community I'm in, and my own life experiences, I was aware of this problem, and I had a passion to do something. I just didn't know what to do, or how to do anything. So it was with this that I sat in a process improvement class. I was in the second row, and the professor started laying out this methodology for us. He uses an acronym called DMAIC. It stands for the five phases of process improvement. In the first phase, the defined phase, you're defining your process, You define the problem. You ask the questions who, what, when, where, why, and how. You lay a foundation for the entire project. Then you move on to the measure phase, and you look at your process, and you look at the outcome of that process. You say, what are all the things that affect that outcome? 
You gather as much information as you can, and when you have that pile of things that affect the outcome, you, you move on to the analyze phase. In the analyze phase, you take that pile of things and you begin to organize. You put some over here, some over here, you begin to categorize, sort, and along the way, you're gonna find a few that have the greatest impact. And those things that have the greatest impact on the outcome, those are our focus when you move on to the improve phase. Because in the improve phase, our goal is to create an improvement plan to reduce or get rid of those things of greatest impact. So you get creative, you have some fun, you're doing the scientific method, you're experimenting, and along the way, you're gonna find your answer. Once you find that answer, we move on to the control phase where we implement that improvement plan and put accountability measures in place. Now, I know that's a lot of information. It was a lot for me, too, and I'm pretty sure if I tested you guys on that right now, you'd all probably fail. But it wasn't this methodology that stuck out to me. It's when the professor started giving us examples to help this idea stick that a light bulb went off. You see, these examples, they weren't business examples. He didn't talk about marketing or manufacturing, operations, management, accounting. Now, instead, he talked about real-life situations, stuff applicable to college students. How could we get better grades? How could we lose weight? Even how could we get more dates? It was when I saw this business process improvement methodology applied to real-world scenarios that I began to wonder, what would happen if we applied this to a greater social dilemma? The fabric of all that I'm saying comes down to the definition of two words responsibility and passion. Responsibility at its core is ability and response. At this event tonight, if my mic goes out, there is someone in the back sound booth. They have the ability to fix the problem and they can respond should the problem arise. Now if that person was sitting in the audience with you, they have the ability to fix it. But they can't respond, and my mic goes out. I'd stand here, I'd wait a little bit, pace back and forth, but I'd probably end up having to shout the rest of this talk at you so the people in the back can hear me. Now, if the same person, they're in the back sound booth, they're ready to respond, they got their job, they're excited, but they have no idea what they're doing, they don't have the ability to fix anything, and my mic goes out, well, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to wait a little bit, I'd probably pace, but I'd probably have to shout the rest of this talk at you so the people in the back can hear me. See, it's when we have the ability to do something and that we can respond that we become responsible. And I believe we should become responsible for our purpose. If you remember right, our purpose is comprised of two things, problems and passions. Problems, well, those are self-explanatory, but passions can be a little confusing. And what are our passions? Passions are things that elicit strong emotion. What's the thing that makes you cry? And I don't mean the cute little tear that you're gonna post on Facebook for all your friends to see. No, I mean, what's the thing that makes you weep? What's the thing that makes you ugly cry? What's the thing that makes you pound your fist on a table in frustration and anger? What's the thing that makes you so overjoyed and happy that you just can't contain it? Those things, I would argue, are your passions. Someone could come up to me, and with the most sincere intentions, the most passion possible, the most emotion, go, Jack, the black-footed ferret is in danger. We have to go do something. I'm going to look back at this person, and I'm going to go, no, you have to go do something. And that's not because I don't care. I think ferrets are cute. They're adorable. But cuteness doesn't drive you to do anything. Passions drive us to sit through long lectures, to stay up late working. They drive us to skip hanging out with friends on a Saturday night. They drive us to shiver in the cold and swelter in the heat. All for a desired outcome. Passions drive action. So you may be asking, well, what's your passion? My dream, my passion, is leaders, families, and campuses free from pornography. My dream is fathers who are not held back by the shame of their secrets. My dream is mothers with close and intimate bonds with their children because they're not afraid of them finding out what they were doing last night. My dream is church and community leaders walking free from the chains of pornography. My dream is college campuses teeming with students, chin high, shoulders back, walking in confidence and grace because they're not ashamed of what they were doing in their dorm room last night. That's my dream. That's where I find purpose. That's what I want to be responsible for. Your next question might be, there's got to be something easier, Jack. Why this? And I'd agree with you. There's probably plenty of things easier. So why? In sixth grade, I looked at an image that would come to dictate my life. I looked at porn for the first time. 
It started off as just an occasional thing. It seemed manageable. I didn't have to worry about it. But it quickly became more regular. Once a week, and then multiple times a week, daily, multiple times a day. What seemed to be something manageable quickly became a full-blown addiction in my life. I was disgusted with myself because, listen, I vowed that no one else would ever know. I built a facade. I built an image. I projected to the world as a young man who had it all together. But on the inside, guilt and shame ate away at every fiber of my being until there was nothing left. That's why I care. Because it breaks my heart to know that there are other people out there that feel the same way I once did. It tears at my soul to know that two-thirds of the people I walk by could be showing me their facade, and on the inside they're being eaten away. That's why I care. That's why I meet with the process improvement professor. We're working on developing a plan or course of action, trying to apply process improvement to the issue of pornography. That's why I'm planning to start research on the topic in 2019. That's why I'm passionate, because I've been in those shoes. Where do you see a problem in the world? What are your passions? Where is that intersection? What is your purpose? I challenge you to find that purpose and then to become responsible for it. When we become responsible, we can make change happen. When we become responsible for things driven by passions, the opportunities are endless. So become responsible. And don't give up easy. Defy expectations. Look outside the box. Look for an ability to do something and a way to respond that no one else has dreamed of looking at for before. It is when we do this, it's when we become responsible for our purpose that this generation, this group of people, can go down in history books as a generation that changed the world. Thank you.